In this episode, I'm answering listener questions about addiction. Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. Well, welcome to another episode of On Finding Peace. And I am Chris, the founder of Life's Journey Life Coaching and your host, for this podcast on finding peace appreciate all of you listening and i really appreciate those uh listeners who submitted a couple questions uh that are dealing with addiction and addiction issues so we will uh take a few of those and do some brief answers first though i'd like to remind all of you that this podcast if you really like it uh, to please uh, leave reviews on whatever podcast uh, medium you are using. And I also uh, would encourage you to go to our um, Patreon page. Uh, just go over to patreon.com and search for uh, On Finding Peace. But it'll also, the link is also in the uh, show notes so uh, you can take a look there. But Patreon is a place where uh, you can subscribe to the podcast by making a small donation, and there are different donation levels. But with those donations, uh, you will receive gifts and merchandise, uh, behind-the-scenes looks. Uh, You'll get some of these podcasts sooner than everyone else. So take a look. Um, the money that is raised, uh, you know, through Patreon goes back to this podcast so that we have the opportunity to continue to bring you, uh, life tips on how to, uh, work on your stress and your anxiety and and to live your life to the fullest in happiness and inner peace. So I think that's it right now for the announcements. So uh, let's move on to our discussion on addiction. Uh, Briefly about myself, I am an addiction counselor. I have specialized in working with people who are suffering uh, from substance use and abuse uh, for well over 20 years now. And I've been doing that uh, mainly in the Baltimore metropolitan area, uh, but also throughout Maryland. So, I've seen and witnessed addiction uh, in many people, thousands probably, and I've learned a lot, not just from the textbooks and the research, but from the people with whom I was working. And I've learned a lot about what addiction means to them, why they're addicted, what makes it so difficult to live a life of recovery, Um, and why is it so difficult to stop doing what they were doing. So I do want a couple uh, basic points just to put out there so that we're on the same page about addiction, or at least not the same page, but you'll know what page I'm on when it comes to addiction. Now also keep in mind this is a topic of which I'm very passionate so just kind of bear with me if uh, I go on a little rants here and there. Um, but it does come from my sense of knowing 
that many people struggle with this disease and that it's not an easy disease to get rid of. And the first thing that I just want to mention is uh, I've had a lot of people through the years say to me, well, why don't they just stop? If you're doing something, and this could be drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, internet, gaming, social media, whatever it is that is an addictive behavior which is causing you stress and anxiety and negative consequences, whatever that may be, when I've had people say, well, why don't they just stop? Well, let's think about that for a second. Of the thousands of people that I've dealt with who suffer from this disease of addiction, no one, I mean no one out of the thousands has ever said to me that their life goal was to be addicted. No one ever said to me that they loved the life that they were leading. So all those people that I have worked with have said to me, I want to stop but for some reason I can't. There's something blocking me from stopping. So if this were just willpower, if this were just, well, don't do it, just stop, then we wouldn't have the problem that we have today. Because all those people who I saw in my office and various treatment centers would have just stopped. So it's not as easy as that. So we have to keep that fact in mind we also need to understand that even though your perception of addiction may be a moral failing, may be a willpower issue, please know that addiction, especially when we're referring to substances, drugs, alcohol, addiction has been classified as a medical disease. And the term is not unlike any other medical illness. So this is an equal disease to any other medical disease. And that phrase was put into effect all the way back to 1957. That's a long time ago since we're already in 2020. Way back then, the American Medical Association stated publicly and in their books and in their teachings that addiction is a medical disease not unlike any other medical disease. Now for some reason that didn't take hold because you have a lot of professionals, counselors and social workers and medical staff as well as just everyday people who continue to say this is a willpower issue even though that definition from 1957 has withstood all the way through 2020 and any modifications made to that have been modifications in how we treat this disease not in going back and saying well maybe we were wrong so there's enough research and especially research within the last uh, couple of decades where we know now the chemical changes in the body, the chemical changes in the brain, the neurological changes in the brain because of all the science that we have and the scanning that we have. So I'm willing to take up the discussion and debate over whether this is a disease or not, but just know that this isn't my opinion. You can go research this and you will find what I'm talking about. So I'm working off of the definition that this is a medical disease not unlike any other disease. So one of my rants here comes in in how we treat people who have addiction. So right now, because the substances, it could be alcohol because of age and the many drugs that are illegal, because there is a legal connotation to what it is that you're doing, we end up treating people with a medical disease by penalizing them, throwing them in the judicial system, kicking them out of treatment for failures and relapses, and stigmatizing them. 
All of this we do even though this is a medical disease not unlike any other. For example, and if you want to take a look at some of my writings over on my website, lifesjourneyblog.com, uh, if you go over to the blog page and click on the category for addiction, you'll see the articles that I've written uh, concerning uh, this topic. But in a few of the articles and in talks that I've given, an example that I use is heart disease, heart attack. So let's run through this example a second. I don't think there's anybody who would argue the fact that heart disease is not a medical illness. And I don't think there's many people who would argue the fact that if a person has a heart attack, that they can be rushed to any emergency room and that emergency room will treat them and do everything in the power to save their life. Now, once their life is saved and they're stabilized and the doctor comes in and says to the patient, all right, we're going to release you from treatment and here's the things that I need you to do to hopefully avoid another heart attack. So what I need you to do is change your diet on a daily basis. Every day you're going to have to eat differently than what you were and here's what you need to do. And you're going to have to do an exercise routine. If you do these things, take your medicine, then the likelihood of another heart attack is diminished. And let's say the person agrees to all of that, the person leaves the hospital, and they do their best in changing their lifestyle. But unfortunately, it's not easy to make a lifestyle change and, and they start to falter a bit and they stop doing the exercising as they were and, and the diet goes back to what it used to be. And they're trying, you know, there's times that they actually do better and there's times that they do a little bit worse, but they're trying. But because they weren't successful on a daily basis, they have another heart attack and they're rushed back to the hospital. And in that emergency room, again, all those wonderful medical professionals are going to do everything in their power to what? Save that person's life. And when that person stabilizes, then they're going to come in before discharge and say, look, we know this is difficult. Here's some support groups we have. Here's what we need you to do. But you really need to start doing this stuff to get your life back together. At no point are we going to necessarily lecture them. Are we going to stigmatize them? Are we going to prosecute them? We are going to refer them to the help that they need so that they don't have another heart attack. But that's not the case when we're dealing with somebody with an addiction. Because in a similar way, let's say somebody who is addicted to opioids, so pain medications or heroin, fentanyl, um, any of the narcotic uh, pain meds that you might get by prescription. And let's say the person is taking this and overdoses, they're near death, they're rushed to the hospital, the medical professionals there do everything in their power to save that person's life, that person gets stabilized and the hospital says, all right, look, you need to go to treatment, you need to stop doing what you're doing, go to support groups, whatever, fine. They leave the hospital, they go do that. They go find a treatment center, they go to meetings, they get a support group, they start doing what they need to be doing to make their lifestyle change. But again, not unlike the heart attack victim, they find that lifestyle changes are not easy to make. And think for yourself, if you ever had to make a lifestyle change, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's not possible. Most definitely it's possible, but it's not easy. And what you then find is as they're making their lifestyle change, certain things start going by the wayside because it is tough. So maybe they're not going to the meetings like they used to in their support groups. Maybe uh, the treatment didn't go as, as well as they thought. Maybe they're picking up some you know heroin here and there. And again, we have another overdose. They again are rushed to the hospital. Medical professionals do all that they can to revive them, stabilize them. But then when they say go to treatment, 
there are a number of treatment centers that will say, well, wait a minute, you've been here a couple times. It's obviously not working for you. We're not going to take you. Can you think of any other medical illness that a treatment center for that illness would ever say to somebody, <laughs> sorry, you've been here too many times. You know, like, sorry, too many heart attacks, haven't changed your lifestyle. Nope, sorry, we're not going to treat your heart attack anymore on your own. But unfortunately, that's what happens with addiction. So all that I'm saying is, why are we treating people differently when in both cases, the treatment, whether it was the heart attack or the addiction to the opioids, what are we saying to the individuals? The treatment is a lifestyle change. But yet, if the one person struggles with that, we help them out. If the other person struggles with that, we start to stigmatize them and push them away. So yes, this is a rant of mine because I don't understand the difference. We're dealing with the same thing, lifestyle change. So what we're looking at when we say addiction, you know, what is it that I mean then when I say addiction? Typically, people who are struggling with an addiction are either, in most cases, trying their best to cope with some sort of past trauma in their life, some emotional event uh, or event that has caused an emotional response that they are having difficulty and struggling to cope with. And unfortunately, they find unhealthy ways to cope with these feelings. So they turn to whatever their addiction is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, you know, any of those uh, addictions. So what they're doing is trying to cope with life at the best way that they know at the moment, even though this is an unhealthy way to do it. Another reason that people will be using is that they don't feel connected to society, to family, to others, they feel very disconnected. So one of the things that we need to do in trying to help guide a person into this lifestyle change is to reconnect them, to bring them into society, bring them back into families, back into support groups. But again, unfortunately, what we do typically with addictions is we continue to put them outside of society. And therefore, that lack of connectedness is reinforced. How do we do that? Well, how many people do we know might be kicked out of their own families, people who are kicked out of their jobs, people who are kicked out of treatment programs, people who are picked up on certain drug charges who now have a felony who are told, well, if you go get a job, then you'll be a productive member of society and it will help in your recovery and lifestyle change. But once you've got that felony on your record, try to go find a decent job. That's almost impossible to do. So again, we're finding ways of stigmatizing and disconnecting individuals who are struggling to get reconnected into society. I don't have all the answers, but what I'm saying is what we are currently doing in helping people with addiction is obviously not working. We have a better rate of heart attack recovery and survival than we do addiction. I think that's now made a bit more clear by the example that I've given. In the one case, we continue to keep them connected and offer them the help, support, assistance, whatever they need to continue on a, a healthy lifestyle for heart care, where the other person we are tending to disenfranchise, disconnect, and push aside and say, you go do this, and when you're ready, when you are off whatever it is that you're doing, then you can walk back into society. So I think that really has to change. So I know I've been going on and on. 
But that answers a couple of the questions um, in, in that one kind of rant uh, that people had offered. There was another question that I thought was very interesting, and, and one listener wrote in asking, why are we as humans prone to addiction? Why does it seem that we have addictions? I think that's a very good question. And my quick answer, again, just for time, my quick answer right now is that I think we as humans have a desire for what we know and an aversion for what we don't know. We tend to focus more on knowing about life than what we don't know about life. Another way of looking at it is we as humans have a tendency to want to control our life and, and the experiences surrounding our life. And when we feel out of control, then that's unknown and that's uncomfortable and that creates anxiety and stress and all of those feelings. So, you know, that, that can in, encourage uh, more of the uh, addictive behavior. So what I think happens as humans, since we have that desire to know our surroundings and therefore to believe that we control ourselves and our surroundings, then we tend to look at repetition in our daily life as that sense of known and control. So when you think about it, if I create a routine for myself, then at least I have a day which is a bit more controlled and known because I'm going to go through my routine. Whereas if my routine is messed up, if I'm not in a routine, then my stress level goes up because my life is filled with unknowns. Now, when we look at the way people with addiction can look at the repetitive behaviors, is even though it's unhealthy for them, their day of using and their way of coping is their repetitive nature of creating a known. So that even though when we talk about your life would be better, your life would be healthier, you would be a productive member of society if you don't do the you know, following behaviors. For many people, they look at that and say, well, not doing those behaviors, even though unhealthy, is still the unknown. And the unknown scares me. The unknown frightens me. So even though they may not want to be doing the addictive behavior, the addictive behaviors become their known. The addictive behaviors become what they say is, you know, what's their control. So if you look at your own life, if you yourself are, are not in recovery or, uh, you know, have an addiction, if you look at your own life, you can see that whenever you've made a change, you know, a job change, a residence change, or, you know, moving into college, moving out of college, things like that, what you find is very quickly you create a routine for yourself. Now that beginning routine may change over time, but it's going to change to another routine and it's going to change, you know, change to another routine. So we continue those routines. So if you can reflect on that in your own life, you have an understanding of why someone who suffers from an addiction is still going to do this unhealthy routine. I would also throw out there that if you want to have an idea of what a person who is suffering from an addiction is going through, if you yourself are addicted to nicotine, so cigarettes, vapes, whatever it may be, whatever your uh, nicotine addiction is, have you ever tried to stop? Because if you have, you understand the difficulty in stopping you understand that you have probably returned to cigarette smoking after a period of stopping and then you go and stop again and then you go back to it for a while and then you stop again for a while and it might take you multiple times of starting and stopping and starting and stopping until eventually you just stop smoking. 
that's not any different than what a person with any other addiction is going through. And actually, nicotine addiction is listed as the hardest addiction to overcome. So if you have that experience of trying to stop smoking nicotine, I, I'm hoping that you now have a better perspective and understanding on a person who is troubled with, say, alcohol or sex or gambling or opioids, cocaine, whatever it may be. So, as we look at, you know, wrapping this up a bit, and, and believe me, I could go on for hours, but what I would highly suggest is if you're unsure of what addiction is and why people are doing what they're doing, do a little bit of research on the web. Find a bit about what addiction is and, and the science and the medicine behind addiction. And reflect on your own life, how you view medical illness and addiction. Is it any different? Is it the same? Again, have you tried to quit nicotine? And if you have, this can give you a better understanding of people who are struggling. I would encourage you that if you know of somebody struggling with an addiction, or you yourself are struggling with an addiction, please know that there is help. People are out there who are very willing and ready and capable of helping you. So seek out that help. If you have access to the internet, you know, look up where treatment centers are, where support groups are, where counselors are, call your local health department. Uh, there's a great resource uh, website called 211.org, or you pick up your phone, cell phone or otherwise, and you dial 211. And you just say to the person who answers, here's what my issue is, where is my help? And they will find you that help. So I hope that this gives you a, a somewhat better understanding of, of what addiction is. Uh, we can have more podcast episodes on this. Please feel free to contact me. Uh, send me in your questions. Um, I'm on all the major social media platforms as Life's Journey. Uh, you just go over to the website, lifesjourneyblog.com. And that'll show you all the places where you can click and leave me messages. And uh, let's continue this conversation uh, about addiction and recovery and how it is that we can help people to find their happiness and inner peace. Thank you for listening. And I hope you all have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.